All right, I'm pressing the go live button. And in theory, we're live. Um, my, my left shoulder hurts, which is awesome. Oh, you got a shot? Yeah, I got Oh, you got a shot? Okay, that was, yeah. that was the, oh, nice. I have a vaccination. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. These um, days with all my inactivity, if I do like a push up, that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No. Oh, so I feel mine, is, mine is just the, mine is just the aging thing. You know, you sleep wrong, yeah, you wake goodness. up and you go, oh, why does my shoulder hurt so much? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or just, you just like suddenly it or something hurts and it takes three months to heal and you don't know why. Yeah. You don't know what you did. It's just, oh, okay. So today my ankle bothers me. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, gets worse. I, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to tell you. Um, so, uh, man, okay. You know, I, I wanted to talk about the, the upcoming lunar eclipse, but actually we've got it in the, in the show. I just remembered. So I should just save, wrote about it today. I should save my enthusiasm for, uh, later on. Cause, uh, you know, West coast, I, I think come this weekend, it's going to start becoming a big deal with people. Yeah. We, I mean, we don't I've get, start, I've nice... started to see some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wait, we'll just save it. Save it, everybody. Yep. Um, I'm going to say hello to some of the people who are watching us. Uh, hold on. Now's your chance. Say hello to us. Hi to Bob Moeller, David Dunn, Gordon Dewis, Ian Farqueron, John Seffel, Johnny J, Larry Beckham, Larry King, Lionel L, Miguel Angel Romero, Nancy Graziano, Rich Wilson, Stephen Hawkins, uh, this guy. Tom Van Scotter. Thanks, everybody. And I'm just going to say Zap Van Zappen, even though I don't see him. Uh, I'm just going to assume he's there. Um, what else have we got? Uh, yeah. So have you all been getting a ton of people asking you about UFOs? I saw 60 Minutes Sunday. <laughs> oh. Oh, all right. All right, P, my mentions, let me tell you. Yeah. You, you yeah. know what's funny, Frazier? You remember that one interview you did about the triangular UFO? I can't remember who it was uh, about a week or two ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. With, that they, with... they used some of that footage in there in that 60 Minutes piece. And I'm like, that's totally been debunked. I saw the guy on Frazier they, about the, uh, the the diaphragm and the camera was triangular shaped and it was just Jupiter. Yes. But they showed it and they, it's like scientists are stunned. They don't know what this is. Like, we totally know what that was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that specific image. Yeah, it's rough. And it's it is interesting to me that people people are saying that I'm not prepared. I'm not, you know, I'm just like not ready for the terrible truth. I've never been more ready. If there's one I... thing that I am ready for, <laughs> it is proof of existence of of life beyond earth. Bring so, it. so many, so many people telling, telling, uh, well, not me personally, but my, my work that, uh, we're clearly hiding something and we're not ready and we don't yeah. deserve the funding that we get. It's like, what funding? Yeah. First um, off. Yeah. <laughs> Can I take a trip now? Can I fly? Can we go? Let's go right now. Yeah. Let's go to the spacecraft. Yeah. Can I meet the alien? Can I get in and get a ride? Can I take a souvenir? Let's do it. I'm ready. We'll take pictures. We'll, we'll take share. pictures like, together. You know, I'll be there with a the get line. Let's go. Like, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. In fact, you know, you know, I always tell people that amateurs and people that actually look at the sky rarely see things that they can't I identify because they're familiar with what's in the sky. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I can't I can't wait. I'm so ready. <laughs> Please, aliens, come on! I want to believe. Um, I just need to. It's the it's the most important thing that we can most important question we can possibly ask. So let's make sure that we're right before we mm -hmm. chase triangular shape uh, <laughs> the, the diaphragm and the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, okay. you know what amazes me is that like. 60, 70 years of, of improvements in cameras and cell phones and all of the images I get are still blurry, distant, fuzzy shapes that it's like, this is a UFO. I'm like, it could be a oh, UFO. It's... Sure, you can't under, you don't, can't identify it. Okay. No, it's Doesn't need the best it. Best it thing. Yeah. Or, or, or the the UFOs are fuzzy. That, that's terrifying that there's a fuzzy UFO <laughs> flying around. Is that I, even I more scary? How does that I even work? Like... What's the aerodynamics of the, of the fuzz? <laughs> 
I always like to, and you see in a lot of the footage that's out now, they say like, it can't move like that. Look how it's moving. And I'm like, it's the camera that's moving. It's not the object that's moving. <laughs> there was one UFO video like that a few years ago and you could see the light doing this. I'm like, that's the camera. That's not the UFO that's moving. Yeah. Oh, but how do they make your camera move? <laughs> So, all right. Uh, don't don't, don't help them with their arguments, Fraser. <laughs> sure. I, whatever whatever allows me to get to meet the aliens, then I will help with those arguments. I'm ready. Like I said. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put you guys all back in your boxes, and uh, we will begin the show. Uh, on to me. All right. Here we go. Whoops. That's not my interview. Intro. Okay. Hello and welcome to the weekly space hangout for Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about the first Chinese rover on Mars, uh, the upcoming total lunar eclipse, deep water on Neptune and Uranus, tidal tales out in the universe. Joining me this week on my screen right now, I've got Beth Johnson. Hey, Beth, how's it going? Good. Hey, Fraser. Good to good to be back after all of the chaos of my life. Yeah, it's it's possible that that we've had people filling in for you uh, for various weeks because of all of that mayhem. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't, wasn't going to do anything on Wednesday night. Anyway, so yeah. always, box, so. Dave is always ready to to be to be <laughs> we death. Can, uh, we we uh we we basically started a kitchen remodel, and anytime you start uh, something like yeah. that, it never never goes according to plan. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that voice you heard as well. We got Dave Dickinson. Hey, Dave. Hey, this is my real background. I'm uh, still in a studio apartment with a telescope in Norfolk. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and we've got, uh, Michael Roderick. Hey, Michael. Good to be back. Awesome. Good awesome to have you back. Background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have similar posters. Um, all right. Before we get on with the, I remember it, everybody, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Before we get on with this week's special guest, I just want to give a huge reminder that you should be joining the weekly space hangout crew. If you're a fan of this show, you should join the crew totally free and you get to become an executive producer right away we put you right to the top we give you all the credentials you need to bring on any guest that you can imagine uh, real or imaginary well real um so go to the wshcrew.space and you can sign up there join the community talk to all of the other space friends and learn how to become an executive producer of this show. And by that, I mean the person who helps organize the guests on the show, because it isn't me, uh, it's you. All right, let's get on with this week's special guest. So joining us from NASA, we've got uh, Ethan Schaller. Ethan. Hi, thanks for having me today. Uh, the question I always ask people, who are you, what do you do? Yeah, so I am a robotics mechanical engineer um, at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. I've been there for about three years now. Um, and I get to split my time, fortunately, between coming up with some cool new research ideas um, for exploring interesting parts of space. And uh, the majority of my time right now is actually spent working on the, the Mars 2020 mission, the Perseverance rover, um, which is now operational on uh, Mars, which is really cool. Um, and launching helicopters and zapping rocks with lasers and listening... Yep, and taking crisp video of everything we do, and yeah, yeah it's an amazing experience. Um, we we yeah. just had a picture that I shared, um, where it used its supercam instrument to take images of the helicopter, like like it was as if it was like looking through binoculars at this helicopter yep. that's way <laughs> off in the distance. It's, yep. Uh, how how different? How significantly better is Perseverance over? like the capabilities of curiosity which is like so 2012. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all i uh haven't been on the mission for for curiosity so i don't know its capabilities quite as well as perseverance um and my expertise on perseverance is is mostly focused on the robot arm itself um so i get to work with that um but i know that i'm also just amazed by the images um i know one of the big upgrades is that some of the cameras are now color images where before they were black and white um, so seeing everything in color um, is pretty spectacular. I know that they've definitely bumped the resolution up on everything. So yeah, um, 
yeah, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, um, yeah, it really just it's 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 just absolutely crazy. You could see it in every picture in in all of the stuff that was leading up to the to the mission as it was making its way down. It's just a totally different experience in seeing Mars than than everything that came from Spirit and Opportunity and 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 Curiosity. Uh, what a joy to have such a wonderful uh, machine. And we're going to talk about its yeah. its new friend that just landed uh, over uh, in the, was it Utopia Planitia region? But anyway, um, but one of the reasons why you're joining us today is you have recently received not one, but two NASA NIAC grants for two really cool missions. And I think everyone watching knows that I'm a gigantic fan of the NIAC awards. Um, they're like opening Christmas presents for me because they're all just these little hints at the future. So let's talk about the, the missions that you've, uh, that you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I probably should first mention that they're, they're NIAC studies. They're, they're advanced concepts. They're not actual NASA missions. Yeah, here's so. a clever idea. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, they're, they're, it's not like you get a ton of money. You just get to yeah. think of a really cool idea and see if there's anything there. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. I hope that one day they, they do get to be missions. But for now, it's the concept that's funded. And, and so we get to go and kind of explore these cool, pretty far out ideas and, and see where they take us. Um, and I guess I can just dive right into yeah, it. The, pick, pick the, one or the other. Okay, so so um, the two the two concepts are float and swim. Um, I'll start with float. That's a flexible levitation on a track, um, and that concept is using magnetic levitation on the moon um, to basically transport material around the moon um, for a lunar base in support of your in situ research utilization um, for water, ice mining, all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the general gist of all those missions is, you know, if we want to have a lunar base that's sustainable, we're going to be harvesting ice on the moon, and we're going to have to be moving a ton of mass mm -hmm. and material around. And often your, your mining site's going to be far from your lunar base and your refining, um, and you need to move the material between those two spots. And um, I'd interacted with uh, two researchers at, at SRI a couple of years ago at a conference, um, Alan Hu, Hu and uh, Ron Pellerin, and they had this cool idea for kind of centimeter scale magnetic robots that that levitate over a track and then you can power that track um it's actually just like a flexible pcb but you can you can run power through it and steer these little magnets around over the track just by generating electromagnetic forces um and we thought okay what if we scale this up by like three orders of magnitude you go from sort of centimeter scale to, to meter scale robots kilometer scale tracks and you can carry thousands of kilograms or tens of thousands of kilograms of regolith uh, around the moon. Um, and because they're levitating, we thought that'd be an interesting way to avoid some of the issues that you see, um, with a lot of robots on the moon, which is your dust is highly abrasive. Yes. You're going to wear everything out really fast. Um, and if you're sending these extremely expensive robots to work on the moon, it might not make sense to have them driving it back and forth repeatedly, just wearing themselves out, transporting material. If you can build this kind of railway system, um, Right. The other interesting twist, though, is, you know, it's hard to build a railway system and, you know, transporting long rails to the moon or even building them in situ is, is, is a challenging task. And so we were thinking about, well, if you can make your track flexible and just roll it up, then it might be easier to fabricate it on Earth, ship it to the moon um, and roll it out where you need it to go. Well, um, there's and a, that's, that's the idea in well, a nutshell. Um, you know, I don't want to push your idea too far, but there was actually someone I interviewed, maybe it was for a NAC award as well, but, but he was proposing a rover that, that went along the moon, gobbled up regolith, pooped out, uh, uh, solar panels and radio antennas for mm -hmm. giant, um, uh, radio telescopes on the moon. And so I can sort of imagine a, a robot that is just driving along, gobbling up regolith and then spinning out uh, some kind of rail system behind it as it goes as well, uh, mm -hmm. depending on whether you could make it flexible. But that's that's cool. So let's talk about that. You know, if it was anywhere else, I think wheels are good. Mm -hmm. So how bad do you think the abrasive regolith is going to be on some kind of wheeled system that's going to run for a long time? Are we underestimating how dangerous regolith is? That's a great question. Um, I think we're, we are estimating how bad regolith is, and we understand that it's going to be a challenge. And a lot of robot designs for kind of future moon robots that I've seen, um, if they're going to last for any 
lengthy period of time. Um, they're really having to study like how do we build wheels that are really durable? Um, how do we seal the motors? Um, there are some concepts I've seen where they, they want to have parts that are modular and can be swapped in and out um, so that you can replace parts that fail. And I think all those are really awesome ideas. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's an open question as to which is going to be the right way to go. Um, you know, even, even for this NIAC concept, we looked at a couple of their ideas, like, you know, um, you could maybe think about a gondola system to transport material where you're, you're just skipping over the surface of the moon entirely. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that's how they transport a lot of material on earth, um, at mining sites. And, and so we're considering all these ideas and we think that this is kind of a, a unique concept for that's, that would work well on the moon. Um, because the, the levitation we use is, is passive, it's unpowered. So they'll just float. The magnets will just float over the track um, without any power. So you only have to use power to move them around. Um, right. But that levitation force is pretty weak. So on the Earth, it's not going to work as well. But when you have your 1-6 gravity, it's, it's suddenly a lot more favorable. Um, Do, does the potentially cold temperatures of the moon allow you to run superconductors? That's another good question. Um, I'm not as familiar with superconductors, to be honest. Um, and I think depending on where you are, the moon is actually quite hot mm -hmm. um, if you're in sunlight. So so in those cases, you need a ton of energy to and a ton of material to, to do superconducted uh, magnets. Right, right. Um, if you're in a permanently shadowed region, it's probably a lot colder and you, you might be able to, yeah. to do that a lot more easily. Um, but the idea here is that we to keep costs down, you, you don't have any really exotic materials. Right. You're you're just using normal permanent magnets um, and a and a basically a, a graphite track that that causes this levitation. Um, and so you mentioned sort of at the outset, this is not a mission. This is just mm -hmm. an idea that you know you really just you're trying to spec out the idea and see if there's any there there. Mm -hmm. What is sort of the key finding? Like when you produce the final report for NASA, what are you hoping? to have uncovered? It's a great question. So I'll get into this for float, and then I can also talk about SWIM, which has its own set of unique challenges and, and interesting applications. Um, but for, for float, what we'd like to do is, is kind of answer a few key questions about just how feasible it is. Because if you're rolling out this track on the moon, yeah, you do still have to think about what do temperature swings do to your materials? You know, we're still worried about the abrasive regolith, like, can it still be tearing up your track? You know, how do we protect the bottom of the track? Um, you know, you talked about how how there's some ideas for robots that can just print a road or, or other features onto the moon. Um, you know, terraforming takes a lot of energy and a lot of time. And, and our idea is kind of that you're able to roll this track out onto relatively unprepared regolith. Um, obviously, some of our studies can look into, like, you know, what's the largest boulder that we don't have to care about, you know, do we right. have to be moving big boulders out of the way, pebbles, can we go over them? Do we have to kind of clean them out? So that's going to be some of the sort of questions that we want to answer in this phase or are, are studying um, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I, I, can, then, I can kind of imagine that you're, there's going to be some kind of balance where you're going to try to run the rails, but then there's like so many rocks in the way, like how do you move them all around and how many, what's the technique you're gonna be able to do that and the maximum turn radius and all that. Yeah, it's pretty interesting exactly. questions. Let's, let's move on to the other mission concept as well. So I think people are now sort of firmly imagining levitating t robot trains on the moon. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about swim. Yeah, so swim is uh, sensing with independent micro swimmers. Um, totally separate concept, um, but a, a similar idea where instead of just one robot, um, we're thinking about a large distributed group uh, or swarm of, of small swimming robots. Um, and the idea for this one is that uh, NASA is really interested in your ocean worlds and, and exploring ocean worlds. And as folks may or may not know, a lot of these planets or moons have uh, basically a thick icy crust and then an ocean under that crust. And so a lot of our initial efforts to, to explore these ocean worlds are going to be getting through that icy crust. Mm -hmm. um, and NASA has a few sort of larger studies going on. You might have heard of the Sesame uh, study, which is looking at, at what kind of melting and cutting and drilling probes might be able to get through uh, the European ice crust and get to that, that ocean. Um, and JPL has, is one of the, the organizations that's performing a study there. Yeah. Um, and so those are all amazing and it, it'd be so exciting to get to these subsurface oceans. Um, but once you're there, a lot of these sort of melt probe drilling type concepts 
anchor at that ocean ice interface. And they'll sit there and they'll sample the ocean water that flows by them. And they'll be looking for, you know, interesting chemistry and, and other biomarkers and, and signs of life or, or, or what have you. Um, but they're not really going to be able to go very far from that initial point that they get that through the ice. Um, and because they need to be kind of a streamlined body that melts its way through, they really can't um, have a lot of payload either. So they're, they're shape and size constrained and they have payload constraints. And so we were thinking about ways that you might be able to add very small robots to this melt probe system um, that can explore the ocean around this mother craft, basically. So having small deployable robots that can explore around the mother craft. And so when you and, say small, mm -hmm. like how small? Yeah, so so we don't know yet. Um, we know that the, the that's part of the study, actually, um, is, you know, we're thinking anywhere from sort of a cubic centimeter scale hmm. up to, you know, having a certain dimension that's in the 10 to 25 centimeter range. Right. So it's, it's spanning a couple orders of magnitude um, in terms of your components on the robot. Um, but it's, it's thinking about, uh, you know, say you only have tens of liters of payload volume, you know, you could send a thousand cubic centimeter robots, or you could send a couple of robots that are a few liters in volume. Right? right. Um, and, and so part of our study is figuring out, you know, MEMS are getting really advanced, you know, cell phones and other technology have, have miniaturized a lot of computing and battery and other components and sensing components. And, and we're starting to think about how small can we pack them? And, and so part of the study is going to be, you know, what scientific measurements do we want? What are the smallest sensors that can do those kind of measurements? And then how small of a robot can we pack them into? Um, and, and looking at basically, you know, do we want to explore 5, 10, 20 meters away from a robot? And at what point do we start getting useful new information that that, that initial mother craft can't get on its own just by sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, and some of this is just that the the conditions under the ice are really unknown, right? It might be kind of a slushy mix of, of ice and water, um, or it might be kind of flowing currents. Um, and so there are a lot of interesting questions about like, you know, what kind of propulsion do we want for these robots? What kind of communication do we need? How long do they live for? Do we tether them or not? We're going to be studying all of those things and and trying to come up with a couple different designs that, you know, one might be really tiny and, and a super bare bones robot that just says, I sense this chemical or I don't, um, and kind of pings back a message that, yes, I see it or yes, I don't, um, up to something that, you know, might have some sampling capability or, or at least a camera on board. So, um, so I'd, yeah. be, I'd be interested to know for you as a an engineer at NASA working in your little department, um, having NIAC as a way to kind of express creative ideas, has that been, um, I'm trying to think like, like what's that experience like? Because I know sort of in the olden days, people would be like, I've got a clever idea for a robot. And someone's able to well, that's a shame because you've got a job, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so JPL's um, extremely supportive of us applying to these sort of far out idea programs. And, and there's a great, in-house group of folks that you know you can chat with about your your interesting wacky ideas and you know across the board everybody's thought the ideas are are cool and fun and, and really supportive of them um and you know i think there is a lot of benefit to be had working both on the mars mission and experiencing what what real flight missions are like and learning the challenges that they face the design considerations that go into building these you know billion dollar robots um and thinking about you know what kind of ideas could complement them, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you have a really expensive mothership with really sensitive instruments. Um, maybe you sacrifice high performance robotics for redundancy, right? In the in the form of lots of little robots, right? So instead of having, and and we've started seeing this with like CubeSat missions, um, right? And 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 even uh, Ingenuity, the the Mars helicopter, right? That's using cots parts, right? And it's got a, a phone computing element on it, basically. Um, so we're starting to see that those kinds of higher risk, um, but more uh, mainstream technologies can still do like NASA missions. And, mm -hmm. and so we're trying to think about ways where you could do that um, in, in new places. Yeah. Um, the caveat I'll say, though, is, you know, there are huge challenges in terms of like planetary protection. You know, we want to go look for life in these ocean worlds. We don't want to bring yeah. life with us. Right. Um, yeah. And so so we also have to think about that. But but it, it, it's interesting because I think we're, you know, with SpaceX arriving with the Falcon 9, with the Falcon Heavy and potentially with the with the Starship, 
before you only got a few shots at sending spacecraft to various destinations. And I think we're very quickly going to enter this realm where there's too much payload space, not enough missions, and there's going to be more of a demand for for interesting, clever ideas to have already had some level of traction that, that can be tried out. Like it's, I think it's going to feel surprisingly quickly where people are going, got any ideas? Let's just, you know, throw them in the open starship and, and send it on its <laughs> way. So, you know, keep them coming. I, I would certainly love that. Um, yeah. I, I think the kind of parallel to that is, is with some of these uh, commercial lunar payload missions where, where they, they're creating landers that have slots for payloads and they're starting to find a lot of cool technologies that they want to take to the moon. Um, I'm not pers personally involved in, in any of those, but, uh, but colleagues of mine at JPL are working on, yeah. on missions that are planned to go to the moon. So, you You've, know, that's awesome too. You, you won all the NIAC grants they were willing to give you this year. <laughs> You're going to have to wait. All your cool ideas will have to come uh, for next year. Uh, well, it was awesome yeah. to uh, to talk to you, Ethan. If people want to keep track of what you're doing, follow your work, where should they go? Um, I think you included some some links on the YouTube uh, bio, but but yeah, I have a I have a website on the the NASA Mars page. Um, I've got a, a website within JPL in our robotics section, so you can look for my information there. Um, I don't have a strong media presence otherwise, but um, but if you want to see what I'm doing there and reach out, if you have questions or, or have a cool idea you want to talk about, always yeah, that's, uh, that's look probably forward best. to talking with folks about about. Uh, cool space missions. Yeah, making robots is more interesting than 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 doom scrolling on Twitter. So I, <laughs> I heartily endorse it. Ethan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Good luck with both. I can't wait to see you get a phase two and then a phase three and to see these things fly and prove there's life on Europa. First, first detection of the European space whales. It would it, it'd be it'd be a dream if I get a phase two after this, but one step at a time. Right. On. Thank you for having me. It's, All right. It's been uh, it's been great. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. All right, let's move on to the space news of the week. Um, I, Dave, I want to talk about uh, the Mars, the Mars mission. Yeah, China landed on Mars with their fire god Zurong rover uh, Friday night. It was kind of an unusual landing because we were all us people that are interested in it were watching it late Friday night, and most of the stuff information we get with as with all things. China and space flight just kind of leaked out via state run television, yeah. uh, their version of uh, social media, like people are monitoring it and, and I'm cramming things into Google Translate trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Uh, there's a few people like Andrew Jones that specialize yes. in following nothing but uh, NASA space flight and actually some amateur radio uh, observers, uh, ham operators are monitoring. I think oh, wow. this is actually kind of cool. They're, they're monitoring the signal. They can get the Doppler signal from the Tianwen uh, orbiter and say, okay, it's at closest approach to Mars. Now it's going back out. And, uh, you know, this is how the information is getting out to us. Uh, yesterday, or actually this morning, we just saw the very first surface pictures. The uh, Zurong rover landed in Utopia Planitia. And if that area sounds familiar, that's where Viking to mm -hmm. the general area. I mean, it's not, it's with still hundreds of kilometers away. But Viking 2 landed there in 1976. That was NASA's second successful mission. And I know that InSight was listening for this landing like it was listening for Perseverance. I don't know if they mm -hmm. heard anything. I haven't heard anything from the InSight team. I haven't seen any other orbital pictures. You, sometimes we see things from like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which has a very high resolution uh, imager on it that can see things on the surface. But it did indeed, Zurong made it down to the surface and we saw some pictures this morning. And, you know, it's interesting because this is only, China is really only the second nation to land successfully on Mars next to NASA and the United States. I don't really count the, I'm in the camp of the Mars 3 uh, Soviet Union 1970 landing wasn't really a landing camp. I know there's a big yeah. argument out there. Anytime I write about this, somebody will say, well, what about Mars 3? Mars 3 la lasted for 110 seconds and it sent back what was arguably the worst picture in planetary space flight ever of static. Right. Uh, that if you look on the Mars 3 Wikipedia page, you can see this image yeah. as, as the first image beam from Mars that it's like, it's just basically yeah. static. So. Uh, your England sent the Beagle 2 and- That, uh, that crashed. Yeah, and then uh, and then Europe your, had the Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli a yeah, few years that ago, crashed. that crashed. Yeah, I actually posted um, that the Great Galactic Ghoul was watching hungrily as 
as as the, uh, the China attempted its uh, to land. The, the Soviet Union tried to land seven times, and Mars Three was their best. Uh, yeah. And NASA actually has a pretty good record. They've landed nine. And there was only one failure was Mars uh, Polar Lander yeah. uh, in 2003. Was the that was I believe the one that they mistook uh, me a metric for English measurement when oh. they uh, well there was there was a conflict. Somebody coded one and somebody coded the other, and, yes. and the calculation was off at the end of the day. Yeah. So although a lot of missions have crashed, a lot of people don't realize NASA's done pretty well. They they've only ever had one failure. For uh, like I said, the Soviet Union and Russia has tried with a few. Uh, they tried a few penetrators that didn't really work either. And they remember Phobos Grunt tried to go to to uh, the Martian moon Phobos in 2013 and didn't even get out of Earth orbit. So uh, they've had they've had good luck. It's weird. Russia's had good luck with Venus and terrible luck with Mars. Well, Venus. I mean, the key for that was just having a, your spacecraft survive. Like actually entering the atmosphere of Venus is relatively simple. It's like swimming down to the surface, but but yeah. it's the it's the horrible surface that you arrive at. And it doesn't I, last for very yeah, long. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, the, it's the crushing pressure that really gets you in the end. Yeah, yeah. well, it's it's amazing to sort of hear the stories of how they were doing that, and they just they they figured out how bad Venus was by by building the toughest r lander they could and then figuring out how it died and then building the next one that much tougher. And then eventually they finally made it to the surface and kept surviving. They, they did, I found out when I was researching for Ingenuity, uh, Soviet Union actually has the, the rights to the record for the first flight. It was a balloon. One of their Veneras had a balloon mission that flew on it. Mm -hmm. So so Ingenuity, you always have to nuance it with the first powered flight on another planet because somebody will say, well, Venera 14 actually uh, had a balloon mission on it that, right. that nobody remembers. That's cool. <laughs> it's like, so, so Dave, what is like you know we're, we're also familiar with you know the fact that perseverance is ingenuity has the arm has the laser has the microphone what yeah. new is is uh well, jurong bringing to to mars that we haven't seen before it, it has a ground penetrating radar and i know the big thing that they're trying to do is they're looking for water ice uh, and they're kind of going to do a ground truth estimate versus what Tianwen-1 sees in orbit. This is actually the first time anybody's done an orbiter, lander, and rover combo all in one package too, because we've had either like Perseverance that was a straight rover, or we've had, you know, the Viking missions had an orbiter and a lander, but no rover. So th this is, uh, they're gonna try to do, uh, look at this area up close and try to, they're, they're after water ice is what uh, China's yeah. looking at. And they have ambitions to do a sample return as well. This is very similar to, they had a successful sample return just last year to the moon. And if you look at the whole setup with the platform and the rover and everything, it's uh, it's it's actually very similar to the U-2 rovers they put on the moon. So it seems yeah. like it worked pretty flawlessly. Yeah, they we were able see. to measure the depth of the regolith on the moon using the, the rover. And yes. what was it on the lander, but on the rover? Anyway, um, and so to sort of use that same technology, but now looking for water ice under the regolith on Mars is a really exciting yeah, prospect. See, it seems like they built this kind of, it looks a little bit like opportunity when you look at, it looks like the smaller, the mid-sized rovers NASA landed uh, back in the early 2000s. And it it's solar powered, it's meant to last for 90 days, uh, is what they're saying anyway. But remember Spirit and Opportunity, they were meant to only last for 90 days as well. And they went for several years yeah. past their warranty. So you never know, this one may last for some yeah. time. Well, congratulations, China. Keep us posted. Uh, don't hesitate to, to post those pictures out onto the internet as quickly as you get <laughs> we, them. We're all waiting we need, hungrily. We need somebody on the inside in the Chinese space agency, especially that we can, uh, we, yeah. we can kind of plug for information because there it's very much like back in the cold war days where we would hear the Soviet union did a thing a week ago. And it's like, Oh, okay. It's like, yeah. you know, it's, uh, they, they, they need to get their information out. It's, I mean, at least, at least we have the benefit of social media and people on both sites yeah. translating yes. things for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My uh, my Chinese is just not up to speed yet. I'm I think it's there. interesting. They have their own social media. They have their equivalents of Twitter and Facebook and all these things. Yeah. That, yeah. I'm that, on uh, I'm on WeChat, which is the which is the version of like, um, I don't know, it's the chat software that they all use. It's kind of like uh, 
oh man, like WhatsApp. And then I'm also on Weibo, which is like their version of Twitter. And, yes. um, and there's, there is a ton of information on Weibo. So that's, and the they're really, and, and weirdly, uh, they're good about posting on their social media about yeah. stuff that happens. That's much we, faster than, than their official website. Yeah. We, yeah. we get ad hoc launch videos sometimes from some of their social media where we're like, oh, there's not a video for such and such launch, but somebody's off site and actually we'll start broadcasting it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, fantastic. All right. Uh, Beth, what have you got for us? Uh, I have the, the apparently very experimental science this week. Um, a team has published a new paper in Nature Astronomy, and they are explaining how they have done uh, an experiment here on Earth to figure out that um, the deep water on Neptune and Uranus, the ice giants, is likely magnesium rich, which sounds like a very oh so exciting story, but it's really cool how they did the experiment. So they took rocks that have uh, olivine and ferropericlase in them and some water and then they compressed it all with a diamond anvil which i just think is like the coolest thing yeah. so it, sort of the, in the similar the, technique to the, they've been trying to make a metallic hydrogen yeah 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 exactly so this allows them because they can use this diamond anvil um uh they can make temperatures and pressures that uh are uh, sort of close to what those actually they can get to these high temperatures and pressures that normally you wouldn't be able to and they they the water drew the magnesium out of the rocks and and into the water. So fluid layers in these these ice giants could be rich in this magnesium, which is which is actually really important because magnesium actually makes for a good uh, thermal insulator when it's in water. So it could explain some of the temperature things we've noticed about Uranus, where it's actually cooler of the two. So it's closer, but cooler. Um, and it might be that, you know, Neptune has managed to pull more magnesium out and that's why it's actually warmer. It's holding that heat in as an insulator. So that's pretty exciting. It's, it's another one of those things that we can use to look at for exoplanets too, hopefully, and, and maybe sort of understand the composition. And I know, I mean, you trawl all the news and did you see that other story that came out maybe from Hubble, um, that, that the, uh, the dynamos of the magnetospheres of Uranus and Neptune are, I mean, they're flipped on their side a bit compared to the axis of rotation of the planets. And they think that it might be because they've got this liquid that's going on at higher levels than down in the core, like the earth does, or even the way the sun operates. And, and so yeah, you've so actually it's... got, got sort of weird dynamics going on inside these planets. I, I, I feel like, you know, when, when we were growing up that it was, you know, they, they, we still had that Uranus and Neptune were included as, as gas giants. Yes. We didn't know any better yet. And now it's like, now they're an ice giant, which is a whole different can of worms, really. Like, it's like, okay, we know what Jupiter and Saturn do, but these two are actually kind of weird. <laughs> they're like more layered than, than, you know, Jupiter and Saturn, it like it changes as you get into these higher temperatures, but yeah. there's Neptune and Uranus seem to be like really broken into more layers, almost like a rocky body, yeah. but with this ice on the outside. And it's and it is kind of interesting because now we're seeing many more examples of objects out there like Neptune and Uranus around other planets and mini Neptunes and super earths and what is the dividing line between these two objects since so you can really see that the more we can learn about these and really tell that line between them the more we can really understand the distribution of, of exoplanets out there and that that line is really fascinating because it's actually a gap <laughs> yes there's there's actually that weird gap where it's like okay we go super super nothing mini neptune <laughs> yeah yeah and trying to just like find how why that gap exists and you know there's there's lots of theories about how like maybe some of this gets blown away, you know, it eventually just doesn't get held down. And so your, your super earths are actually mini Neptunes that have lost their atmospheres. Yeah. So there's, I, I am fascinated by how planetary formation theories are changing basically on a weekly basis around here. Yeah. Agreed. All right, Michael, <laughs> uh, what do you got for us? Uh, we have tidal tales in star clusters. Um, so this is, Essentially, star clusters, you know, we, you think of a cluster of stars as this nice, little compact sphere. Um, but it turns out if you look a little closer at some of them, they've got some extended features coming out from that center, that central star feature, feature, star cluster feature. Um, and so this comes as a result of, of course,
course, anything, if you're going to study anything in the Milky Way these days, it's going to be from Gaia. Gaia is kind of like the source, the holy grail of all knowledge in the Milky Way. And so with, um, with proper motions, um, we are able to kind of determine what star is actually part of a star cluster. So in the past, you could just look at all the stars that are distributed about the sky. Here's a cluster, and just based on the the distribution of stars, you could say, okay, that star is probably part of that cluster. But now you have extra information. You've got these parallaxes. You've got these uh, proper motions, like the distances and, so, and their and their motions, right? Yeah, exactly. And so you can you can get a much better idea of whether or not some star is actually part of of this cluster. And so you run these learning algorithms, these classification schemes um, on this data set, and it can kind of pick out likelihood of the star belonging to some group of other stars. And so for this um, this star cluster in particular, um, let me get the name of it, NGC 752, just one thing. Um, but when you look at it, it has these two tails coming off of it. Um, and so this is likely due to some interactions that this cluster has encountered in its, its lifetime in the galaxy. It's about a billion years old. And as these star clusters move through the galaxy, they're going to encounter dense objects like giant molecular clouds or just densities in the spiral arm of the disk of the galaxy. And so gravity from those objects will kind of pull on the star cluster. And as time goes on, the star cluster is going to what's called mass segregation, which means that all the massive stars can fall to the center of the cluster. Less massive stars are on the outside. Those ones can get uh, pulled apart a little bit easier. So this is kind of a new addition to um, several other guy discoveries of these tidally disturbed um, open star clusters that we see in our own galaxy. It's it's kind of interesting that this idea of this mass segregation that you get this star cluster that starts out as a random distribution of stars of, of varying masses, some bigger, you know, some 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 less massive. And then just these interactions with the other stars and the and the galaxy's gravity sorts it into mass. So which way does it go? Is it do the is it closer to the core? Is it farther out? Are they is it leading in orbit? The 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 mass of stars are going to fall to the center. So it, it should be a as I understand it spherically spherical symmetry. So the mass of stars in the center, and then you get the less massive ones are kind of the outer the, the center of, of the, the cluster. cluster right okay yeah, so like but, near the core right but then it but then the whole thing is getting stretched out right like yeah so you should have still all those massive ones are going to be still holding the center and the less massive ones um get pulled out and so when you do when you actually study the masses of the the distributions of these stars in that cluster you are still seeing that in the center you have the high mass ones and then it's the outside the ones in that tidal tail, those ones are the less massive uh, stars. All right, so I need to be uh, a little self-serving here. What does this tell us about the history of the solar system? We started in, uh, a, solar system? We in a star cluster like that, didn't we? <laughs> so that is a that is a very open question, right? Is how many stars form in star clusters? Um, so there are some camps that will say almost all stars form in star clusters. There are some that say well, you can have individual star formation, then there's the pedantic question of what is a star cluster? Whoa. Is it just any conglomeration of stars? What is anything? How can you gravitationally bound? <laughs> so, 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 okay, fine. Then what is, I mean, I, I don't mean like what is a star cluster because obviously we know what a star mm -hmm. cluster is, but, but that more kind of existential question that you're posing mm -hmm. here, what are the implications of this? It's so, right. So we think that our, our sun came from some collapsing cloud of of hydrogen gas, and as that cloud fragments or collapses, it can fragment and form um, kind of clusters of stars, and those stars can get kicked out of that cluster. So theoretically, there is somewhere out there a twin to the sun that we were born together and we just yeah. got ejected from. Um, so this is showing that even if you do form a star cluster, even if you do form a dense star cluster they don't always survive. There are these mortalities that they can encounter as they go about the galaxy, and that will essentially disperse that cluster and spread those stars all across the disk, and it kind of destroys evidence that there ever was 
this original star cluster. Um, Larry Beckham is asking an interesting question uh, that red dwarfs are the most numerous of stars. What is the farthest red dwarf that we can see? Do you know how far we can actually detect red dwarfs? Because it's they're pretty dim. Yeah, there's not a single uh, naked eye one in the sky. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even the brightest like Proxima Centauri, one of the closest ones, you can't see. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wolf it's ironic that the it's it's ironic that the most common star in the universe we is absolutely not represented in the night sky, at least to the naked so eye. Yeah. It's the the most distant we've detected so far is UDF twenty four fifty seven. So very very, very what, what, well named here. What magnitude is it? Visual. <laughs> Does it say? I no, oh, it doesn't have a visual magnitude on this, but it's fifty nine thousand light years away. Oh, that's okay. halfway across yeah. the galaxy, so that's not bad. That's <laughs> impressive. Um, very interesting, Michael. All right, uh, Dave, I've been holding back on this one. Let's talk about the upcoming lunar eclipse that yes. I will be able to see. I made it about myself again. Okay. Yeah, um, you're you're just in the window for it. Yeah. Actually, it's centered on the Pacific. It's a. I'm so excited. It's a, yes, it's, it's a total lunar eclipse, and it's centered on the Pacific region in the western United States, western South America. We'll see it early, early in the morning on Wednesday the 26th, and far eastern Asia and Australia, we'll see it that evening on the 26th. Now, out here on the east coast, unfortunately, we're just going to see it as the partial phases get underway as the moon is setting and the sun is rising. So I might try to get a photo of it right before the moon sets of, hey, the moon is the, the shadow is just taking a small bite out of it. So uh, um, so it's going to be for me, um, it's a morning eclipse. Yes. Like I'll want to get up at like three in the morning and then watch mm -hmm. the moon. And then just as the sun is coming up, the eclipse will be wrapping up. Yeah, you'll you'll see all of totality there. Yeah. And it will just be the partial phases for you will be finishing up just as the sun's coming up and the moon is setting. Yeah, who cares? Partial yeah. phases. This, this is a very yeah, it basically it just reverses itself going out. You know, it starts as a penumbral, which is really faint. You can't see it. Then it goes into a partial eclipse where the moon's going into the dark umbra. Then totality is the blood moon part where you get the filtered sunrise into the shadow and the moon turns red. Now this one should be very bright because the length of it is 14 minutes and 30 seconds. That's very short for totality for an eclipse. As a matter of fact, I took a look and this is the second shortest totality for the 21st century. The shortest being, remember back in 2015, we had a total lunar eclipse that was only 12 minutes long. And it was interesting because that kind of sparked a discussion a lot. And I actually wrote about this uh, after the eclipse that the uh, the moon to a lot of observers were they were saying it didn't look like it was entirely total to them because it didn't quite go uh, that that outer limb stayed bright the entire time and this is kind of a function of the the Earth's shadow isn't quite uh, sharp it's got more of a ragged jagged edge to it than you would think it's not a really and a lot of that's owing to the atmosphere and deflecting light into the shadow and things like that. So this one may be a very bright eclipse, too. It's not going through the umbra, the inner part of the Earth's shadow. At that distance, the moon is three times bigger than the full moon. So it's going to probably, uh, I'd say this is going to be a fairly bright eclipse. It's not going to be one of those hmm. really deep eclipses. Right. But we haven't had a, a total lunar eclipse since January 2019. So it's been a while. And last year, we only had four penumbral lunar eclipses, which penumbrals are the lamest of, yeah. la of eclipses where they're they're almost not even worth setting your alarm for because you barely can see them. Not almost, so. like they are not worth it. <laughs> well, you know, one thing you can do in a penumbral if it's deep enough, and I've told people to do this, uh, take a photo of the moon before, during, and after. And if you look at it, you can see mm -hmm. just a little shading on the moon. Yeah. Photographically, if you have a side-by-side -side comparison, you can tease out that penumbral eclipse if it's deep enough. So uh, that that's about really all you can do with penumbral. I definitely wouldn't travel to see one or anything. <laughs> yeah, like it is. That, so. It is a bit of a fun game when the when the eclipse starts and you look at the moon and you're like, can I see it? Can I see it? Because it is such a it's such a faint effect before the the chomp starts to appear. From and when the, you're when yeah. you're photographing, especially when it gets for totality, you want to really start slowing your exposures down because you'll be going from like a hundredth of a second, two hundredth of a second. Suddenly, when you get in totality, uh, depending on how dark it is, you might want to go down to one or two second shots. Yeah, uh, because it, it, it's the, the camera will start to lose it a little bit. It depends how dark the eclipse is. Well, we got Shaw is in the chat 
and we yes. know he's in Malaysia. He's in so, Malaysia. So he should have he's, a really good view to it. He's got it in the evening. He's yeah. actually, Shaw, you're in the line too for something that was called a, a Selenellian, which is kind of an interesting visual uh, feat of athletics to, to try to see the eclipsed moon and the sun above the horizon at the same time, which you can barely do right at that one, if you're right along that one band. And that works because again, the Earth's shadow is a little bigger than the moon. So if it lingers up in that shadow and you have the sun up above the horizon at the same time and refraction helps a little bit too, to get one opposite to the other. I've, I've had people ask me, well, how is that possible if the moon has to be exactly opposite? Shouldn't it set when the sun comes up? It, it does very nearly, but sometimes if you can be right in that right position, you can manage to, I, I think the best way you could catch, you know, I looked around for photos of the Selenellian and in the, probably the best thing you could do is like a, if you had a 180 degree lens or something mm -hmm. like that, like those kind of fish eyes that shoot the entire sky. Of course, the sun and the moon will look like dots at either end because right. it'll be a very wide field of view. But there's not a lot of photographs of this kind of effect out there. It's, it's just a neat little, yeah. Th uh, uh, visual athletic challenge to try to see something like this. I'm, I'm kind I've of imagining a like a like a mirror where the mirror has some kind of of like blocking like smoked glass or something like that. So you're you're able to see the sun, the without, sun. without without it destroying the telescope and destroying the eyeball. <laughs> and then at the same time, having the telescope being able to see the moon I'm... and having them side by side. And maybe I'm thinking you can, you can see like them the, together. Those those 180 degree, like the the meteor shower, all sky cams. Maybe yeah. maybe yeah. manage to catch this this effect well, in one. It's just a neat little thing to try to well, do. Well, Shaw's intrigued, so it, <laughs> so it might very well be that uh, that he's going to take a crack at it, and uh, and and he's always creative. So maybe he'll come up with something that we've uh, you know this, never seen. This this also sets us up for, and this is going to be a big deal come June 10th, there's an annular solar eclipse nice. because eclipses always occur in seasons because the moon is near that node. So along the ecliptic. So once you have a lunar eclipse, we're going to have an annular solar eclipse. And this one's going to be over North America. It starts, the annularity starts over, it's the, bay, the, the Hudson Bay in central Canada going that way. So most people won't see the annular phase, but what's kind of interesting, a lot of people along that Minnesota, Michigan, they're going to see the horns of the moon kind mm. of rising. I expect to see some interesting shots because you'll get that annular eclipse, uh, that, that kind of horns of the sun actually coming up at sunrise. So that's very photogenic. You can get it with things in the foreground and stuff like that. So that's going to be an interesting eclipse. Oh, as well. that's interesting. Yeah. So you, so you could like, if you set things up, right, you'll get the sun with horns and you can have it be yep. beside the heads of things or be I've being seen held, some by, really... held, you know, held under, under bridges or people, you know, setting up. There was one a year or two ago that was, uh, I think it was off the Oman that somebody had shot with a boat and it literally looked like the devil was coming out of the water kind of wow. next to the boat. I was like, just with the glowing horns, it's like, that's cool. I think here in Norfolk, I think we're going to have a, uh, maybe a 20% partial eclipse rising, but if it's clear, I'll probably try to shoot that as well. Yeah. I, one thing that I really love is, is finding something with, that has a lot of small holes in it and then casting a shadow all at the yes. same time. And then you'll get this, this speckle of little eclipses on the ground or whatever it is that you're, I, you're projecting. I got a, uh, I got a partial solar eclipse rising in front of the vehicle assembly building down in Florida that took some planning to do <laughs> and hoping it would be clear that morning. I scouted up the location the day prior to make sure I had the VAB in the sun coming up just at the right angle. But that, that, that came out pretty cool. Fantastic. All right. We've reached the end of our, of our hour ish. Um, I want to give my co-hosts a chance to shamelessly uh, self promote the things that they're working on. Dave, you're still on my screen. So tell us what you're working on and, uh, and where people can find out more. I am Astro Guys with the Z on Twitter. I am a frequent contributor to Universe Today, Sky and Telescope, and now Astro Gear Today, where I'm reviewing astronomy gear. I am the author of first book, Universe Today: Ultimate Guide to Observing the Cosmos. And it's strange to think this is this uh, Deep Sky Guide has already been out for a year. Yeah. I'm also author for that. Um, I'm author for whatever. If a publisher wants to pitch me anything yeah, else, or the trilogy, like, it really should be a trilogy. So we'll need to we'll need to workshop. Well, a, a well this first idea. one, 
this first one was everything in astronomy. I wrote it as if I'd never write another book. So I just like, here's everything in astronomy in my brain in one book. Now this one is just the deep sky chapter in one yep. book. So now I'm taking all those chapters like satellite tracking, solar observing. Those could all be books. Yeah, you know, perfect. Uh, all right, Beth, what are you working uh, on? Where can I people am... find out more? Oh, okay. Well, you can follow me on all the social medias at Planetary Pan. Uh, Instagram is Planetary underscore Pan. But most of what I'm doing these days is either at CosmoQuest or at SETI. Um, and we are currently working our way through uh, Stargate's top 10 episodes, one for each season on our science review show, Grudge Report. So we are we will be taping uh, the season six episode this week. So very exciting. Looking to have uh, special guests about Stargate later on. Hoping. Fantastic. So. Um, Michael. I'm on Twitter at Michael Roderick. I post lots of cute photos of my foster dogs. Uh, I am going to be putting my head down and trying to finish up my dissertation. So I'm going to be pretty quiet when, for when, the months. When do come. you defend? It's going to be late July, early August. I'm still waiting really? for two committee members. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so, lots so, of panic. I, I don't know if you saw Moya live streamed her defense. Hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. That was pretty cool. It was pretty I cool. Still need to watch that. She had a lot of cred. Yeah. I think it was a great she, idea. It was pretty neat. And then they, they showed the they showed pictures afterwards of her like where she's standing in her room with her bare feet and just, you know, comfortable. So Yeah. I recommend. Yeah. Let, let me know if you we'll, need we'll someone see. to help engineer it. I'm uh I'll give you a hand. That's so that'd be uh, that'd be great to see another defense. That right. this will be the thing that we do. Because I mean the moment you joined this show, your PhD was guaranteed, but now totally. it's a matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we mint PhDs here on the Weekly Space Hangout. <laughs> it's what we do. Um, but uh, but yeah, anything we can do to make this process less painful for you, the the better. Um, congrats, yeah, congratulations in advance. If we if we don't if if you're not on the show before you actually do your defense. All right, uh, and of course, I'm Fraser. Uh, you can follow me at, at F. Kane or at Universe Today on all the things. Um, great interview on my YouTube channel with Dr. Casey Hammer, who also works at NASA JPL, and we just blabbed about starships and zeppelins and battling space junk with powdered sugar. So if you're interested in any of those topics, you're going to want to check out uh, the interview that I did this week. Um, I'm going to put everybody back on the screen and thank you everybody for watching us both here on YouTube and all of you over on Twitch. We really appreciate all of your ongoing support. Thanks to all of the moderators and especially Nancy Graziano for wrangling us and the special guests. We, and I'm not going to lie, would not be able to do this without you. Don't ever leave us, Nancy. We love you. Um, and uh, yeah, and thanks to all my co-hosts and our special guests this week. It was a lot of fun. And uh, everybody stay safe. We'll get through the rest of this pandemic. And uh, especially we'll see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. All right. Stop the stream. There we go.